33 and 34. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at verses 31 and 32, and verse 31 read like this, What then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who can be against us? And we focused primarily last week on the theme of God is for us. We touched very briefly on this question, who can be against us, but we said that we would focus a little more on that question this week. And I'd like you to do that for a moment. I'd like you to think about perhaps who you think is against you. Now, maybe if you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, you might immediately think of Ottawa Senators fans or Montreal Canadian fans or something like that. And if those are the worst enemies you have, you're probably in pretty good shape. But perhaps as we ask that question, you might think of, uh, perhaps if you're a student, you might think of someone in school that consistently opposes you and gives you a rough time. I know I ran across a few bullies when I was in, uh, in school. And, uh, or perhaps in your neighborhood, there's someone, maybe a neighbor, might even be your next door neighbor, that seems to be consistently against you. And it's a bit of a grief to you. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's your boss. You know, all of us share a common adversary. All of us, whether you know it or not, or whether you believe it or not, have one that is consistently against us. And he's depicted or portrayed in this somewhat spooky picture that's on the screen now. This is the way that uh, Satan was portrayed in the movie The Passion. And it's interesting that that name, Satan, literally means the adversary, the one who opposes. And we see this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8 where we are cautioned as believers to be diligent or exhorted to be diligent because our adversary, the devil, prowls around in this world like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that word, the devil, comes from the Greek word diablos, which means the slanderer, the one that slanders, the one who seeks to bring us into disrepute with God. And that's exactly what he seeks to do. So Satan, the adversary, the one who opposes God and his elect, and we see that word elect in verse 33 today, uh, and we'll get to reading that in a moment. And that speaks of those of us that have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scriptures teach us that if we've put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have aligned ourselves with God's purpose and plan and We've been looking at that in recent times. And in fact, that God had that purpose and plan for us from, for, from before the foundation of the earth and that we were chosen by him to be the beneficiaries of that great salvation. We are God's elect. But make no mistake, Satan opposes not only God, but also uh, his people, those that are part of his family. Turning your Bibles for a moment to First, or rather to Job chapter 1, we see this idea of Satan as an opponent at the beginning of the book of Job. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. And we don't often think of Satan being in heaven. We think of him being a fellow in a little red suit with horns and living in a place somewhere in the middle of the earth where there's lots of fire and lava and things like that. But the scriptures teach us that in fact, at this point in time, Satan still has access to the throne of God. That won't always be that way. The time is coming when he will be cast out uh, completely out of heaven and he'll no longer have access to God. But at this present time, he still has access and the scriptures teach us that one of the things that he likes to do is to appear before God and accuse those that are part of God's family. And we see this in Job chapter 1. There's actually a, a fairly unique scripture that gives us a view of the sort of thing that Satan does and how he has earned his name and his title as 
Satan, the adversary, the devil, the one that slanders. And we see in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And in this context, the sons of God refers to the angels. And so the angels have come before God. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Doesn't that sound a little bit like 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8? Prowling around in the earth, seeking whom he may devour like a roaring lion. And it says in verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear for nothing? And here we see the accusations and the slander, the defamation of Job's character. And this is the evil one's specialty. And he does it right before God. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's Satan. At his worst. That's what he does. He loves to appear before God, and for this, for a time, God will allow it. And he accuses and slanders the brethren, those that have faith uh, in God, and in this age, in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the accuser of the brethren. The scriptures describe him. Jesus Christ himself described him as a liar and the father of it. The father of lies in John chapter 8. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he's referred to by Paul as the tempter, the one that would solicit and entice us to sin. See, Paul raised this question in Romans chapter 8, and you can go back there in your Bible now, <clears throat> of who can be against us. He raised this question that we looked at briefly last week in view of the great salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we've been studying that systematically as we've gone through Romans chapters 1 through 8. And that this great revelation comes at the end of this study, midway through Romans chapter 8, that in spite of our perceptions that God is for us, that every circumstance, everything that happens to us, God is using to accomplish his purpose that we would be like Jesus Christ, that we would bear his image. And ultimately, that will happen one day when we see him face to face. But Paul also raised this question that if God is for us, who can be against us in view of Satan's op opposition to God's elect? He raises this question in view of the fact that Satan is, in fact, against us. And it's interesting, the time that this letter was written, probably in the late uh, 50s, 50 AD, late 50s, 58, 59 AD, that is just shortly before a great persecution would rise up in Rome against Christians. And that happened around 65 AD, as far as, as I can remember, when uh, Christians were literally fed to the lions. A great martyrdom took place. And it's interesting that Paul would raise this at this point in time. If God is for us, who can be against us? Because you see, Satan's business, so to speak, is to promote rebellion against God, to oppose good and righteousness, to encourage evil and sin, and to entice Adam's race to sin, and then to go before God himself and to accuse and slander believers before God. <clears throat> I'm going to take that off the screen because... I know that some people find that picture a little bit spooky. And Satan is a bit spooky to think about. The scriptures say that we humans, those that are part of Adam's race, were made a little bit lower than the angels. And Satan, it would seem, is one of the greatest angels that God created. The scriptures teach us that he corrupted himself, that he desires to have the place that is only God's. And that he corrupted himself with that desire. And he knows that the time is coming 
when God is going to put him in his ultimate place. And he seeks to take as many with him as he can. Christ referred to him as the God of this age and the prince of the power of the air. And make no mistake, he does rule over those who are not of the faith in this world. You don't have to look very far to see some of the things that that go on. We see great tragedy around us. Just recently, just this week, we've seen a great tragedy take place in the United States. And you would shake your head and say, how could such a thing happen? How can such a thing happen? Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8 and verses 33 and 34. It says that who shall bring a charge against God's chosen people, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God and who also makes intercession for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures we've read already and we thank you that we've been looking at how you indeed are for us, how you have a purpose for us, and it will be accomplished, how you have rescued us from Satan's clutches, Father. And we thank you for that salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we trust that as we look into your word this morning, that we are a blessed people, that we have been completely blessed and saved by you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray that your spirit might open up our minds and hearts, that we might see Christ And we might see the wondrous salvation that we have in him. And these things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, the scriptures teach us that it's not God's, or that it is God's will for us not to sin. As believers, we know that, and as believers, we find in our experience, though, that we, there are times that we do fall into sin. And we know that Satan loves to accuse and slander. We saw this with Job in the first chapter of Job. And we read in this verse 33 and 34 that Paul raises the question, who can bring a charge against God's elect? And who is he who condemns? The question becomes... Can anyone successfully bring a charge against God's chosen? Against Christians? Against you, if you're a believer? Can anyone bring a charge concerning sin that would lead to your condemnation? That's what Paul is, that's the question that Paul is asking here. We know as believers that we're not supposed to sin. And we know that Christ's death has delivered us from sin's power. We looked at that. Uh, weeks, months back in Romans 6 and 7. And we know that if we abide in Christ, that when we trust in Him, when we make Him the central focus of our desire and devotion, and we walk in the Spirit, that in fact we don't sin. But we also know that every Christian is in a battle. And we read in Galatians chapter 5 that the flesh wars against the Spirit. And Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that we need to put on the full armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He is a wily one, a crafty one, very intelligent, but entirely corrupted. And when we are in the flesh, when we're not abiding in Christ, when we walk, when we live, when we think, when we make decisions, when we open our mouths, speaking primarily of myself here, and we're not in the Spirit, and we're in our own flesh and in our own strength, we are easy targets for Satan. Incredibly easy targets. Again, man was made a little lower than the angels. In our own strength, we we don't have a chance against this adversary. That's how powerful he is. And if there's one thing that he desires more than anything in a Christian is to see us make anything except the Lord Jesus Christ our desire and devotion. Anything. It could be your golf game. It could be your car. It could be your girlfriend. It could be your career. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Anything. If you, can, if you will put it before Jesus Christ, it will take you out of the mode 
of abiding in Him. And it will put you into the mode of the flesh. And then He's got you where He wants you. He's got you where He wants you. He desires our devotion to anything but Christ. And we know that as believers that we're not supposed to sin, and we've been studying these marvelous scriptures in Romans 6 and 7 and how we've been delivered from sin's power. But the strange thing is that there's still times that we do sin. And you know, not only is Satan at work enticing Adam's race to sin, and that includes uh, those of us that are believers. And when we operate in the flesh and in that sphere of Adam, we know that we will not only be tempted, but that we will give way to that temptation. But his work doesn't stop after he has enticed us to sin. He continues to do his business after we have. And one of the things that he's going to do, uh, you can almost count on this, given what we've been studying as we've gone through Romans, is that when he has enticed you into sin, and it might be that you've spoken an unkind word, or you've lost your patience, you've blown your stack, or you've gossiped, or you've had impure thoughts, or whatever, and the list goes on and on and on, endless opportunities that we have to sin. That you've done that. And that when you do that, you might not be surprised that some of the following thoughts might come to mind. And these are the sorts of thoughts that Satan himself promotes. He might whisper, or and keep in mind that when he fell... When he corrupted himself, the scriptures would indicate that something on the order of one-third of all of the angels were taken with him. And not only is he in this world prowling around, but those spirit beings are doing the same thing. We might not necessarily draw the direct attention of Satan. I'm, I'm of the conviction that he tends to focus on the big targets. But certainly his minions and his allies... are are at work amongst us, if not he himself. And there's a spiritual battle that goes on. It goes on in the mind. It's the place of our thoughts. And you might wonder sometimes where some of these strange thoughts come from. Well, don't be surprised if some of these thoughts, which Satan promotes, might come to mind after we've been studying this in Romans. That perhaps when we struggle and we fall, that that we might begin to think, well, maybe this stuff that we've been looking at so far in Romans really isn't true. In particular, this thing about me being delivered from sin's power because I keep falling into sin. And then maybe there'll be this thought that maybe you're not secure in Christ. Here's a favorite one that Satan likes to promote. You're not good enough. You're a substandard Christian. You keep sinning And God is very, very disappointed with you. You might as well give up and go back to living the way that you did before you became a Christian. In fact, are you really saved? Satan loves to plant those sorts of thoughts and questions. Do you remember what he said to Eve? Did God really say? (laughs) He's the master of the half-truth. The scripture says that he masquerades as an angel of light. We don't know exactly what he looks like. I had a picture up there before that is Hollywood's depiction, latest depiction of perhaps the way that he looks. We know that he appeared as a serpent to to Eve in the garden. And as I said, he masquerades as an angel of light. But not only will he and his um, uh, allies work in that area of the mind in terms of planting those sorts of thoughts, and it It might come through some other person even. Have you ever been in a discussion with someone about spiritual things and some of those things start to come out? Some of the tough questions and some of the accusations and perhaps even slanderous things against God, against Jesus Christ and against Christians? We know where those come from. But as I said, his work isn't finished there that he accuses and slanders us before God, just as he did with Job. Revelation says that he is the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God. How often? Anybody know? Night and day, it says, continuously. That he's there accusing believers, the brethren. And you can imagine that one of us falls into sin, and, and I know I do. I do. I know I've had the kind of week where I don't have to look very far to see some of the things that happened in my life this past week before I see some sin. And 
there's something that he loves to do that when he, when he, when he is successful in enticing a believer into sinning, that he loves to go before God and say, look at what he's done. Look at what she's done. Your, your own word says the wages of sin is death. So what are you going to do about this? Can you just picture him there? And maybe after it's happened a couple of, thing, a couple of times, Satan will go and say, you see? She's doing it again. He's doing it again. They're sinning again. Don't they deserve to die? Your word says the soul that sins shall die. They deserve to die. They belong to me. Let me have them. These are the sorts of things that I imagine Satan to do when I've fallen into sin before God, just on the basis of what the Scripture says of what he does, that he is a slanderer. He is the opponent. He is my adversary and your adversary. But when that happens, what does God say? What does God say? You see, sin... And this is the truth. Not because I say it, but because God's Word says it. And it doesn't matter whether you're reading from an NIB or, an NIV or a, uh, a New American Standard or the original King James or a New King James. They all say it. That sin changes nothing concerning the believer's secure position in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean that we have license to sin? No. If that thought crosses your mind, and that's one that Satan will like to plant in your mind as well, you need to go back to Romans chapter 6, which says, how shall we live in that which we died to? We died to sin. We do not have license to sin. The reality is, though, that there's times that when we dwell in that old realm of death in the flesh, that it is going to rear its ugly head. <clears throat> but the sin, that sin, when it does rear its head changes nothing concerning the believer's secure position in the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says the soul that sins is worthy of death, but for those of us that have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus Christ has paid that death price for us once and for all. He is our substitute. He's the one that went to the cross and he died his death for me. He went there as the last Adam. And he dealt with Adam's race and Adam's and the sin of Adam's race in one glorious act some 2,000 years ago. It's interesting that there's times we get tangled up a little bit with some of this in the way that we think about our sins being forgiven. Sometimes we think of our justification, and we've been looking at that in Romans, that is, our sins being forgiven. We look at our justification and think about it as if it happened when I first put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that rightly. Okay? In order to be justified, in order to have your sins forgiven, you need to, of course, recognize and admit and acknowledge that you're a sinner, and you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scriptures say that if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you're justified, that your sins are forgiven. And from our human perspective, we tend to look at that time. We might say, well, it was in uh, 1987, on July the whatever, that I first put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's when I was justified. And you'll say, and my sins were forgiven. But we have this perspective that we look at that time when I first believed. At the time before that, I was not a believer, and of course I sinned when I wasn't a believer. And I have this perce per, uh, per perception that my sins past are forgiven. But we know as believers that we're not supposed to sin. And Satan might even accuse us and say, okay, well, I can understand that you sinned before you became a believer, but what excuse do you have now? You've fallen into sin now. Are you sure you're still justified? Maybe you've sinned a little too much and you're not justified anymore. These are sorts of things that, that might go around in your mind or might, might even be suggested to you. And sometimes we might even wonder about our future. We have this confidence when we look back at the sins that we committed before we came to know Christ and that they've been dealt with. But what about the sins that I've committed since I became a believer? I'm trying to stop sinning, 
but I can't seem to do it. Things are getting better, but my old man raises his, his, his head every once in a while and there's some ugly stuff happen, happening and, and I feel that accusation of conscience. And I entertain some doubts. But you know, we need, really need to have God's perspective on this. And this is why it's so important to be in the Word of God and to put our trust in what God's Word says. You see, God's Word and God's perspective on this is that our justification happened at Calvary's cross. That's when we were justified. Now you might say, well, that was 2,000 years approximately before I was even born. Yes. That's when God justified you, was at, was at Calvary's cross. And when God looks at your sins, he looks at the whole ball of wax, so to speak. Not just the ones that you committed before you became a Christian. Because his perspective is from the cross forward. And for that matter, even from the cross backwards into the Old Testament. But we don't have time to go into that today. But when God looks at it, and when Christ went to the cross, he had in view all of the sins of the world. Past, present, and future. And from God's perspective, the sins that you've committed before you got saved and after you, you got saved are sins, and all of them were dealt with at Calvary's cross. Again, does that mean that I've got license to go ahead and sin as much as I want now? No. Go back to Romans chapter 6. You died to sin. That's the victory that Christ gave you at Calvary's cross. You see, Christ died for all sins, not just some of them. The scriptures say that he died for the sins of the world, that he paid for all of them. What then is the difference between us and everyone else? Well, the unbeliever has rejected that gift of redemption. Christ purchased us. He bought us out of sin's slave market and redeemed us, paid the price by his own death for our guilt. We deserve to die. And Satan loves to tell God that about us when one of us falls into sin. But Christ has died for us. And we have availed ourselves of that redemption through faith. To our glory? No. To God's glory. I don't go around boasting to people. We shouldn't go around boasting to people that I've believed. No. Our boast is the one in whom we have believed. And we sang that. I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That's the security that the believer has. He's going to look after me. Because he has purchased me. You see, verse 34 Ask this question, who is he who condemns? It's a rhetorical question. And then it says, it is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, and look at this, who also makes intercession for us. Turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 2. He's at God's right hand and he's making intercession for us. We need to... I find, anyway, it useful to think of the, a picture of a courtroom. And that's what this is. A modern court. And you see various people there, the judge. and uh, There'd be one, uh, one lawyer there, one attorney, that would be accusing someone that was guilty. And there'd be another one that would be defending. And there's a jury and different people watching and so on and so forth. And really, that's the picture in Romans chapter 8 and 34... And it's also the picture in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Look at what it says. My little children, John, the Holy Spirit, God, speaking to us as his children, as members of his family. This is spoken to believers. These things I write to you so that you may not sin. It is God's will that we not sin. And, or but, if anyone does sin... Know this, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know what an advocate is? An advocate is like a defense attorney. One that would plead our case before a judge. 
And that's exactly what Jesus Christ does. Picture this for a moment, that we're in a courtroom, and that sin that you committed this morning, perhaps, before you came to church when you had an argument with your spouse, or uh, your mother, or your father, or something that unkind that was said, or that movie that you watched really last night that really a Christian shouldn't watch, or whatever it might be. And by some miracle of modern technology, poof, you find yourself in a courtroom, and there's a guy that looks a lot like that picture we had on the screen before, Satan, that's there before God, and he's accusing you. Look what they've done. Look what he did. Look at what he's been thinking. And look at the things that he says. You call him a Christian? And God is sitting behind the bar. The Father sits there. And he pauses for a moment. And then, someone steps to the bar. And his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ steps up to that bar. And he glances at Satan. And then he looks at the Father. And he says, Father, your word says that the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. That's what I did 2,000 years ago. When I went to that cross, that nasty thing that Mark said on Friday, I died for that. And the Father looks at Jesus Christ. And the Father stares Satan in the face. And the Father looks at me, the accused, and he smiles at me. And he says, that's good enough. The payment has been made. You've been redeemed. And he dismisses Satan and says, go away. You have no just accusation against this person. You see, the scripture says that it is God who justifies He's the one that decides who's righteous and who is not. And we know by our own actions, we are not righteous. But we know that by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been credited that righteousness. We are not righteous by practice, always. But we are counted as righteous and considered as righteous by God. Why? Solely because of what Jesus Christ has done. And when I fall into sin, it doesn't change that. It doesn't change anything. Because Christ died for the sins that I've already committed and the ones I haven't, I haven't even done yet. He, he dealt with those things at Calvary's cross. Isn't that what it says? My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, sin know this, that we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the whole world. Every sin that ever will be committed in this old creation, Jesus Christ died for at Calvary's cross. And when Satan comes before God and accuses a believer of sinning, Jesus Christ walks up to that bar and says, Yep, he sinned all right, but I paid for that. I paid for that sin, and not only that sin, but all of the sins that this saint will ever commit were paid for at Calvary's cross. And God says, I'm satisfied. That's what it means in verse 2 when it says, and he, that is Jesus Christ himself, is the propitiation for our sins. We don't use that word propitiation very often in our everyday language. But the simplest way I've to this point in my life, been able to paraphrase it, is that God is satisfied. He shakes his head and says, that's sufficient. That's what I was after. That without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. My son shed his blood for this person. They have trusted in that. They've accepted that gift from me. Oh, there's people that that have argued and said, no, I, I don't need my penalty paid, God. I don't need Jesus Christ. Sadly, when Satan brings accusations before God of those, they will be condemned. But the difference for us is that we have availed ourselves of that gift of Christ's advocacy. That we have said, yes, please, Jesus, intercede for me. 
And what a loving Savior He has. He, it says that He does that continuously, that He's at the Father's right hand. And that God is satisfied with that intercession, with that advocacy, with Jesus Christ stepping in. You see, what it says in Romans chapter 8 and these verses that we've been looking at in the last few weeks, these are rhetorical questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? Absolutely no one. Not even Satan himself. Perhaps one of the greatest beings, created beings that God has made. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who can successfully bring a charge against a believer before God and make it stick? No one. Not even Satan himself. And who can condemn a believer before God? The answer is no one. Not even Satan himself. Right? The beginning of this chapter, we started off, it said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Absolutely no one can. Why? Because I'm a good person? No. Why? Because since I became a Christian, I stopped sinning altogether? No, that's not true. I know it's not true for any of you either. Why? Because Jesus Christ is my Savior. He satisfies God. Okay. Our time is just about gone. I just want to suggest a practical application to this. And it really comes from uh, 1 John as well, in the verses that precede the ones that we just looked at. Brothers and sisters, the time is going to come, and if you're like me, it probably comes fairly often. When as a believer, you disappoint yourself, you may disappoint your family and friends, and even unbelievers around you have expectations of you as a Christian, believe it or not, and you'll disappoint them too, because you're going to sin. And there's a natural tendency as a believer to want to pretend that because I'm a Christian, that I'm perfect. And there's a natural tendency to want to resist admitting that when we sin, that we really have. We want to cover it up and pretend that it hasn't happened. Because we know that as a Christian, it really shouldn't happen. But the scriptures say that when we do that, that we're not walking in the truth and we're not walking in the light. And that that attitude interrupts our fellowship with God. Oh, sin in our life cannot change the relationship that we have with God. But it can impair my walk with Him, my fellowship, my ability to abide in Christ and to grow in Him. If I'm in the practice of covering up and pretending that the sins that I've committed don't really happen. We're worried about it. We don't want to admit that it happened because we're afraid that if the accusation sticks, that perhaps it might change something between us and God. But the Word of God says it doesn't. It doesn't change things one iota. Jesus Christ paid for those sins at Calvary's cross. You see, when we do fall into sin, the Scriptures encourage us, bring it out in the light. Right? Bring it out in the light and abide in the truth. The Scriptures say that in verse 7 of, of 1 John chapter 1, that when we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from the sins that we committed before we first accepted Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? No. It says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. All sin. And that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. And verse 10 says that if we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. The verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, he, that is God the Father, is faithful and just. Right? What does it say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? We just read about it in 1 John chapter 2. Because we have an advocate with the Father. We need to have that confidence. Oh, there is someone that's against us, but he will not succeed. He that, it, that is in us is greater than the one that is in this world. We sang that earlier this morning. Oh, Satan is powerful and he's a wily one, but he's not greater than my God. Absolutely not. He may be the God of this world, but he's not the God of the universe. He's not the almighty God that's able to use every circumstance 
to accomplish His purpose in me. Notwithstanding Satan's opposition to you and I, he will not succeed. He may be against us, but he cannot stop God from accomplishing His plan in us. And when we do fall into sin, we don't need to be afraid that that's going to change our relationship with God. We might know that Satan might go before God and accuse us, but we also have the confidence that that accusation will not stick because Jesus Christ is there at God's right hand interceding for us as our advocate. And his blood and his death are so powerful that it has paid the price for all of my sins. All of them. And we can go to God in our own private prayers and we can confess to God that sin and tell God about it just as it is. God, this is what I've done. And we don't have to beg him for forgiveness. One might even say you don't even have to ask him for forgiveness. You should go and confess this sin and thank him for the forgiveness that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what confession of sin is for the, for, for the believer. I go, I tell God what I did, and I thank him that Jesus Christ paid the price for that sin when he went to Calvary's cross. That's the confidence that we have. That's what we should do when we fall into sin. We don't have to worry about whether or not we're secure. We don't have to worry about whether or not someone can oppose us successfully and bring a charge against us and condemn us because it's God that's the righteous judge. He is the only one that has the authority to justify. And the scriptures teach us that if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has justified us once and for all in the Lord Jesus Christ.